Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala ali wa sahbihi wa sallam amma ba'da habita fillah continue on and perhaps this may be our last uh, lesson of this treatise and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward the the Shaykh Shaykh Ibn Rahim Rahili hafadhallahu ta'ala immensely and grant him forgiveness and bless him to correct his mistakes and to go forward and to continue to bring about good to rectify the affairs of the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward us and forgive us of our many sins and our many mistakes and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward the translator and forgive him Shadeed Muhammad hafadhallahu ta'ala and all of the Muslims in general. Amin ya Rabbil Alameen. And so we reach the end of our treaties. And the Shaykh ended it on the 10th point, which is a series of advices or advice. And he mentioned, we, we reached a point where he was talking about the third piece of advice, the third point that he wanted to advise the youth of Ahlul Sunnah with regards to the sickness of declaring one another to be innovators for mistakes, simple mistakes often, and the other controversy of splitting and boycotting. So these are his advice and his way and means of trying to rectify this sickness, which is the role and the goal of the Rabbaniyun. So the you find this from the major scholars and the major scholars of Ahlul Sunnah throughout time is that they were rectifiers. They weren't destroyers of the communities of good, but in fact they helped to produce khair and helped to produce a rectification to help people better themselves and to build themselves and to build their communities based on the Book of Allah and the Sunnah, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Minhaj of the Salaf al Saleh and to have that akhwa, the, the brotherhood, the Islamic brotherhood which is part of the maqasid of the shara or is part of the intent of the shara is to bring about that Islamic brotherhood for a higher uh, purpose uh, and divine purpose, which is to worship Allah Azza wa Jal alone. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, in, uh, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, Inama mu'minun ikhwa, verily the believers are brothers. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that uh, one of you does not truly uh, love uh, one of you does not truly have iman until he wants for his brother what he wants for himself. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, A Muslim, Akhu Muslim, you should do Ba'dhu Ba'dha. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that the Muslim is a brother to the Muslim and they strengthen one another. So these are principles to help strengthen the Islamic Brotherhood in general and specifically the brotherhood between Ahlul Sunnati wa Jama'ah. Those people who are in the same usul, same menhad, same methodology. And in fact, Islam calls us to be one hand so that we have to leave off bid'ah, we have to leave off our mistakes, we have to leave off uh, our desires and adhere to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as one community. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Kitab al-Kareem, وَاَعْتَسِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا Adhere all of you steadfast to the rope of Allah and do not divide. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to adhere to the rope of Allah, which is the Qur'an. Uh, and some the Mufassirin say the uh, Jama'ah or the Sunnah and all of those meanings are um, not are, are, are in accordance with one another and that Islam who is Sunnah, Sunnah to and the Sunnah is Islam and so it's imperative that we adhere to the rope of Allah as one community and know how to deal with one another's errors and mistakes and that's what the whole point of this treatise uh, was to give us some uh, uh, usul for dealing with that, dealing with those issues. So the Shaykh mentioned the third point. He said, know that takfir, tabdi' and tafsik is the sole right of Allah. So avoid categorizing a Muslim to be a disbeliever, meaning takfir, or an innovator, tabdi' or a rebellious, disobedient sinner, tafsik, especially if he does not deserve to be categorized as such. 
even if he considers you to be a kafir. For indeed, Ahl sunnah do not combat oppression with oppression. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah said, very important, so I want to stop before we get to the statement of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah. So it's very important, and this distinguishes Ahl sunnah between Ahl bid'ah. And I want to give you some examples that we see for those who follow uh, our, our YouTube channel and our lectures, is that what you see, look at how many of the takfiris, every time, just because they disagree, that they have to make tikfir. They may call you a, a, a kafir. They may call you a hypocrite. They call you a um, you know a paid informant. They call you racial racial names. I get all kind of things. Many of the things I don't post because, as I mentioned before, my channel is not a posting for uh, uh, spreading sinfulness. So we don't mention racism and racial comments uh, and things that are attacking people by their. Uh, you know, characterizing people in an evil way, except for with the hak meaning that we allow, maybe someone says someone is an innovator and maybe they bring the truth, maybe they bring some proof. Or I might allow a comment uh, if it's a criticism of me or even my, the scholars or what have you in order to refute or for some other purpose. However, it is not a place to spread wickedness in sharm. So, the adab of Ahl Sunnah differs with that of Ahl Bidah. Ahl Bidah, if you disagree with them, they make takfir of you, they call you a hypocrite, they call you this, scholars for dollars, they call this, 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 this. Ahl Sunnah, you differ with them, they maintain adab. They say you're incorrect for this, and I believe you're a mubtadiyat for this. Bow, bow with ilm, with thiq, with sunnah. And this is a big difference you see. Uh, that even we tried our best for, with our many shortcomings when we speak about takfiris. Uh, like, uh, you know, that are mubtadiyat, like uh, Faisal Jamaiki or Abu Hamza Misri or uh, Abu Qatada, Philistini and others, we don't care about their nationality. We don't care about their characteristics as far as their traits. Abu Hamza has this deficiency or he looks like this. We don't care about those things. Those things are outside. The, that has nothing to do with ilm or fiqh or Islam, you know, and those are things outside of the scope of an individual for whether they whether they look jameel or not, whether they look handsome or not, in our view, that that those are just uh, prejudices that have no place. But rather, we stick to the mistakes that we see of ahl bid'ah and we classify them therein. So we say he's a mubtadiyah, whether you get offended or not, that's your problem. But we try to do that with hujjah wa bayan, with clarification and proof and evidences, and that is the difference between a rad al miya you know, a Sharia-based uh, refutation that's based on knowledge versus one that's based on desires. One that's based on desires is going to be characterizing people and call, just name-calling, uh, cursing people, making takfir of them, which is a characteristic of the, the usul of many of Ahl bidah but especially the Khawarij and others. Throughout history, they classified Ahl Sunnah and, uh, you know, with many wicked names and descriptions. And so we have to be careful to always maintain the proper adab, you know, manners, even when criticizing, because we want good. For example, people have heard me speak about Yasa Qadi. They've heard me speak about Nu'man Ali Khan. So I want to make this clear for anybody who's listening, is my difference with them is not about, uh, you know, in fact, we all have national, you know, we're American nationals, if you will. We're all Muslim. I believe they're Muslim. I believe that they have uh, bid'ah in their methodology for calling to Islam. That's that's where we differ, you know, in, in statements and in a slub in da'wah. That's where we differ. And so it's not about race. It's not about this. Nor would I, even if they criticized me, I would never, uh, you know, Oh, he said this. Well, he's like, you know, to, you know, one up on him or to make takfir of him or to, you know, clear him a wicked fasic or something. No, it's you have to do these things based on knowledge and ban, not based on your desires and wanting good for them because they're Muslims. So that means they're my Muslim brother regardless. Even if you have beef or disagreements with your Muslim brothers, you should never tajawaz. You just never go beyond the bounds. And if you characterize someone with such wickedness and hatred, it'll be so hard for you to either come back or them to be able to come back. If they speak so so many evil, wicked statements and then they make toba or you make toba or whatever, whoever's incorrect. And then 
how can you have the ahua after that if someone has spoken about your family and someone's spoken about this and they you know made racist statements about you or this and that and the other so it's very important to keep everything within the bounds of the shark and and i want to mention take this time to mention another point that i benefited from this sheikh sheikh ibrahim raheli the author of this treatise one of the benefits i benefited tremendously that he always mentioned in so many of his drus and i studied you know, just just so you know, it's not just I listened to some tapes of his. No, I sat under his beard for about four years when I lived in Medina. Pretty much most of the time I was in Medina, so probably more than that. But definitely finishing many books and, and so on and so forth with the Sheikh. And one of the, the, the principles that he emphasized a lot, and I'll never forget, and I try to implement, even with our taqsir, even though we make mistakes and the Sheikh makes mistakes, all of us make mistakes, as the Prophet ﷺ said, Adam All the children of Adam commit sins, and the best of those who sin are those who repent. And one of the principles that he mentioned is that when you uh, talk about knowledge-based issues, use the al-fad of the shara. And this was the way of ahl sunnah Okay? That you use uh, al-fad of the shara. So that means... For example, that you don't spend a lot of time coming up with new names and new this, but rather you try to uh, refer to things. And even when you're speaking, try to restrain your statements because it's easy to start talking about other Messiah and other issues, which is OK. But to be careful not to go out the bounds of the shutter. And what we notice from some of the du'at is they'll start talking about issues, some and then they'll come up with new statements and new mustalahat and new terminologies uh, when the shara had already uh, sufficed, maybe in that area. And then they come up with a new alfad, and those alfad sometimes get them in trouble. So it's very important, as the sheikh always emphasizes, to stick with the alfad of the shara. So let me give you an example, just in case it's not clear. For example, when we say we're Salafi, okay? Salafia is an alfa that comes from the shara. It comes from uh, going back to the salaf al And you'll find many of the ulama of the past, those who referred to themselves, you know, Imam al Dhahabi mentions many people and so and so was Salafi or something like this. So you'll find those kind of statements and you'll find that there was those referred to as the salaf al the first three generations. So that is a sharia based alfa. It is a sharia based name and terminology. Whereas if we say Dio Bundy, no, this goes back to a place. So when someone says they're Dio Bundy, Dio Bundy, or they say they're Ashari, like some people post and they say I'm Ashari Sunni. Why would you even need to say you're Ashari Sunni? Why wouldn't you just say you're Sunni? You know, and you've got to think about, well, where does Ashari come from? Is that a Sharia based term? Is that coming from an individual? So that's why you see the sectarianism of many of the groups and sects is that they refer back to a particular individual. They go to ta'asab, you know, they blind follow and they have prejudices and they make taqlid and they make new terminologies and new allegiances and they make al-wallah wal-bara, they make loving and hating based on their individual, based on their madhab. Where ahl sunnah suffices, we just take what ahl hadith, ahl hadith is an old name, it comes from hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, firqat al all of these names, ahl athar, these comes from names from the shara. They come from terminologies of the early scholars, the classical scholars, and they come from, uh, you know, terminologies that might have been used in the book of Allah or in the son of the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, or by the sahaba, radiallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'een, or the tabi'een with tabi'a tabi'een. So this is very important to always try to uh, use those terminologies. So, uh, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he said, uh, after the shir, we, we need to go back. So this third principle, it is that takfir, tabdi, and tafsik are sharia-based principles. These are from Allah. So we, that means there's no room for your desires in this. You can't just say, well, I have a beef with so-and-so. He is a disbeliever. You know, and this is what you have. You have so many people, they don't know how to discuss an issue because they have no knowledge. They're like the empty cup. This cup is empty. It was full of coffee, but now it's empty. So the individual who has no knowledge they don't have anything to pull from. They don't have any knowledge to pull from. So they have to revert to racism. They have to revert to discrimination. They have to revert to name calling and foolishness. And this is the kind of ignorance from Jahiliyyah instead of something from the Shara. That's the difference between Ahlul Sunnah and Ahlul Bid'ah. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah says, the Khawarij. Now this is important. 
listen to the statement, and I want you to, to implement this. And those who see these takfiris, these modern-day takfiris, and modern-day people who make tabdiyat people, listen to the statement from, from Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah. He said, the Khawarij pronounced takfir on those who stick closely to the jama'ah, ahla sunnah, as do the mu'tazila. Mu'tazila do the same. They deem anyone who oppose them to be disbelievers, as do the Rafida, the Rafida Shia. And if they don't pronounce takfir on him, then they deem him to be a fasik, a wicked sinner. However, Ahlul Sunnah follow the truth from their Lord, which has come to them by the way of the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and they don't make takfir on the one who opposes them. Rather, they are the most knowledgeable of the people concerning the truth and the most merciful of people to creation. And this statement is found in uh, his uh, Sheikh al-Islam's book called Minhaj al-Sunnah, but also you'll find something similar to this in Aqidah Tawasatiyah. So look at that. Look at the difference. And, and, and I just want to emphasize that, and I want you to go back and really... Uh, Think about this principle that Shaykh al-Islam shows you so much. It just seems so clear to me and when, when I read this and when you see it in front of you, you know, some of these things we studied, we didn't really know because we weren't out in the world to really see. But when you now see and you see how people, people most of the people are ignorant, the lay, lay person, and they speak so much and give fatwa about the deen. And then there's so many takfiris and so many other extremists and when you disagree with them, they can't hold a, a conversation with you. They can't deal with you even respectfully, a respectful way of dealing with the difference. And even if you're innovators, there's no respect. There's no, instead it has to go down to the lower desires of cursing people, threatening people, discrimination and racism. That's, that's all they have because it's an empty cup. But it's a refreshing cup of water when you can at least discuss if it is a majal, if there is a place for that to discuss with someone from Ahl Bid'ah or someone who has some mistakes or whatever the case may be to be able to have a, a sensible discussion, you know, based on knowledge. That, that's refreshing compared to foolishness, which you can get from Jahiliya, you can get from the disbelievers anytime. If you want to go with the gangbangers and have a beef, they'll cut your throat and shoot you in the face about uh, disagreeance, just about disagreeance, or they just don't like you. And that's the same kind of jahiliya behavior that unfortunately we find from uh, people who are Muslim even, that you disagree with us, we're going to send our boys to threaten you. You disagree with us, we're going to make takfir of you and tibdi and use a slander campaign against you. You disagree with us, you know, there's no, there's an, and, and it's not based on knowledge. It's based on hizbiya. It's based on uh, desires and group and sectarianism and partis partisanship. The fourth principle the Sheikh mentioned, he said, avoid boycotting the brother who boycotts you. So this is another difference between Ahlul Sunnah and Ahlul uh, Ahl Bid'ah. So we see the Sheikh has given advice. Don't just boycott someone just because he's boycotting you. Oh, he's not talking to me. Shoot, I'm not talking to him. No, it doesn't have to be like that. You could actually reach out and say, Ahi, what's, what's, what's the problem? You know, if, if, if it's okay to do that. If he's a violent person, maybe you can't. Maybe you just got to roll with the punches. But, but let's see what the Sheikh is saying. He says, avoid boycotting the brother who boycotts you, especially if his hajr of you is not admissible. So if it's not a permissible hajr, then don't just uh, boycott him just because, oh, you're doing this to me, I'm going to do this to you. No, keep these affairs knowledge-based. He said, instead, hasten to give him the greeting. You know, rush to give him the greeting. Salaamu alaykum, akhi. And let him be the one who's foolish because then you're protecting yourself from the sin. The sheikh says, be gentle and lenient with him and remove from him the misconception by which he is boycotting you. Okay, so try to uh, influence him with, uh, you know, the knowledge-based arguments and dealing with him in a, in a way which is based on the shark, not based on hoa, because hoa and hoa just means, usually brings about destruction and, uh, you know, destroys the dawah and all the khayr. The sheikh said, sixth, uh, the next point is the people who find fault with you and criticize you by belittling you for what, for who you are, or by attributing some false accusations to you by using statements that oppose the minhaj, which how many people of ignorance, they call you this, they call you that. Uh, 
that oppose the minhaj of Ahlul Sunnah, like saying he's astray, or he is a deviant, or he is ignorant, or he doesn't have any understanding, don't seek retribution for yourself, or you will fall into self-praise, and this is clearly a destructive path. So that means you don't have to rush to defend yourself all the time. There are times when, yes, of course you defend your honor and stuff, and you're going to come, and this is a beautiful example. The Sheikh illustrated this example, and I can, like I said, for years I sat with the Sheikh, and I saw during the fitna of Fale al-Harbi, and he never mentioned who was a for those who don't know, is a scholar from Medina who fell out with Sheikh Rabi and who went astray with a lot of extreme principles that you could even see were extreme back then. But unfortunately, a lot of the young, the youth and a lot of those du'at in the West followed them. Some of them that were claiming Salafiyah, they followed him in his Hezbiyah. He was calling it Hezbiyah way back then and we couldn't even detect it. But from a point of fitr, you understood that this guy, you know, there's something going on. He's just... You know, clearly, you know, making statements like there's no Salafis in all of India that he knows. You know, weird. Those are twisted statements. There's no way you can make a judgment on a place as big as India. When there's so many of Ahl Hadith and there's so many people of Ahl Sunnah. It's just ridiculous and insane almost. But the point being, Habitifillah, that I was sitting with the Sheikh and he never mentioned him specifically. And for those people who are aware of what was going on, because he made tip D and was criticizing many scholars in Medina that were known for the Sunnah, and unfortunately other scholars were supporting him at that time, and he, uh, uh, you know, was doing all these these criticizing criticisms which were incorrect and were based on desires. But the Sheikh never once, even that. He always spoke general and he never defended himself. SubhanAllah, that's what amazed me. He didn't even bring that fitna. He kept teaching us the principles of Ahl Sunnah. And that was a great faida. Same with Sheikh Abdul Razak al Badr. Same with many other of our mashayikh of Ahl Sunnah until one of the senior scholars, Imam Abdul Mahsin, had to put him in his place and slap him. Not slap him physically, but slap him with al Muthiq and also with his own record. You know, in his book, he mentions that. So it's very important, Habitifillah, not to just get in a, a blame game and, you know, name calling and foolishness. And, and, and if you're attacked, it doesn't mean you have to rush to defend yourself and praise yourself. So that's what you want to be cautious of. And that's what the Sheikh is talking about. He says, Ahla Bid'ah, the people of innovation used to describe Ahla Sunnah with some of the vile and hideous descriptions. But Ahla Sunnah would never pay them any attention. Instead, they would restrict their refutations of them to the errors made in the religion and advise the Ummah accordingly. And indeed, we have in them a beautiful example to follow. Did you hear that statement? There's nothing I need to say, but I'm going to read it again. Ahl Bid'ah, the people of innovation, used to describe Ahl Sunnah with some of the most vile and hideous descriptions, but Ahl Sunnah would never pay them any attention. Instead, they would restrict their refutations of them to the errors made in the religion and advise the Ummah accordingly. And indeed, we have in them a beautiful example. Then the Sheikh said, however, if they accuse you falsely of something, so this is, here's, here's the point. And this is, he, the Sheikh has given you some kawai here, something to uh, practice and understand these principles. He said, however, if they accuse you falsely of something, for example, if they say so-and-so says such and such, or by such a statement, he is accusing you of saying something that you didn't say, then you have the right to negate this from yourself in order that you are not accused of falsehood. The ulama have never ceased refuting and negating false statements that are attributed to them unjustly. So if you're dealt with unjustly, the meaning that the persons, the people lie about you and attribute things that you didn't say or misrepresent what you say, then you have a right to uh, defend yourself and to correct that error and say, no, that's not correct. That's not what I said. That's not what I meant. My other statements support that. You've cut and paste, whatever the case may be, but deal with it knowledge based. That's what the Sheikh is saying here. He says, this is not considered self-praise. Rather, it is advice to the Ummah. So there is a difference between this matter and the one mentioned previously. Therefore, hold tightly to the guidance of the ulama in this regard and do not follow in the footsteps of the ignorant ones who if someone criticizes him, then he fills the dunya with praise and extolment of himself and we seek refuge with Allah from being abandoned by him, meaning being abandoned by Allah Azza wa Jal. So that's very important. That's a different. Ahl Sunnah, you got to remain humble and strive your best 
to not just because someone's attacking you doesn't mean you need to attack back. But if they're accusing you falsely and it continues, then you have a right to uh, defend yourself and set the record straight because they're transgressing against you, you know. And so uh, and I think that's that's very clear. Then he said, as a last point, he said, no, that people are honored and dignified based upon their actions. So if you are upon the sunnah, then every day you will be honored therein for that. And only by a few days will pass, except that you will eventually become an imam, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and we made from amongst them leaders giving guidance under our command when they were patient and used to believe in our signs with certainty. And then the shaykh, he says, and if you are upon bid'ah, innovation, then every day you will be honored therein for that, or you will be remembered for that by those who follow you. So meaning, th th this is that hizbiyah. So as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kulu hizbi ma ladayhim every, uh, every group, they rejoice in what they have. So for example, if you have a group of brothers and they make tabdi of everyone, they're happy and they find their rejoicing and their honor with one another, with the praise they get from the youth. The youth might praise them. Oh, so-and-so is so good. Did you hear his refutation of this one? And the refutation might not even be knowledge-based. It might not have any value. And it might be based on lies and exaggerations. But every group, they rejoice in what they have. So this is why it's very, very careful. We have to be cautious and about hizbiyah and being wanting and loving praise and support, and especially support for falsehood and bid'ah. So he says, uh, and if you are upon bid'ah, then every day you will be honored therein for that by those who follow you. And only but a few days will pass, except that eventually you will become an imam in that realm. As Allah said, say Muhammad, whoever is an heir, then the most gracious will extend the rope for him. So meaning that, you know, Allah may let you still continue on that path of misguidance until you destroy yourself. So it's very important to avoid hezbiyah. Allah said about Fir'aun and his people after describing them with arrogance, which they had no right to exercise, and we made them leaders calling to the fire. Can you imagine being a leader of deviance, a leader of misguidance? He said, so choose for yourself from your deeds today. What will define for you what type of imam you will be tomorrow? This is what I wanted to present, and Allah knows best. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon his slave and messenger Muhammad. Uh, and this was written by Shaykh Ibrahim ibn Amr al-Rahili, half of Allah Ta'ala in Medina in the year 1424. This treatise was translated by Abu Zubair Shadid Muhammad, corresponding to December 12, 2006, in the Prophet city of Medina. Uh, and the Sheikh's permission was sought, and uh, we ask that Allah Azza wa Jal makes this a benefit for us all and puts it on our scale of good deeds and not on our scale of bad deeds. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward the Sheikh immensely and bless him to continue to be a source of guidance and, and bless him with guidance himself to be the ikhlas with the battle of Sunnah and forgive him and us for our shortcomings. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless this sitting that we've had in going through this treaties to be of something on our scale of good deeds and forgive us of our many, many sins and many shortcomings. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless Abu Zubair Shadid Muhammad for his translating this fantastic work and bringing that to the youth of Ahlul Sunnah in the English speaking world for those many who have benefited in English. And may Allah put it all on our scale of good deeds and forgive us all of our sins and shortcomings. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.